State of the Sun Devils with Jeremy Schnell, Jesse Morrison, and Mitch Bereldis and Arizona Sports Podcast. Hello and welcome into another edition of State of the Sun Devils alongside Jesse Morrison and Mitch Ferreldes. I'm Jeremy Schnell. Well, there's some big news coming out of ASU football this week, guys. Uh, Brian Ward was extended for three years, the defensive coordinator. Um, Initial thoughts. Yeah, initial thoughts, Love it. And it was a report that came out earlier in the day yesterday, and then I believe Coach Kenny Dillingham on his Sparky Stent show, which was on ESPN 620 last night, confirmed the news. So this is... Encouraging, if nothing else, and Kenny Dillingham already gets an A-plus in my book in terms of building a staff that's helped going to build the next iteration of great son of a football. We saw what Brian Ward was able to do against Washington and that defense. We saw what the defense was able to do in the second half against Washington State. Those are just two recent examples, but the defense has been awesome for ASU all season long, Jesse. Yeah, um, I think we saw earlier in the season... They had some trouble stopping the run. They're a bit more big pass plays than we expected. But you look at their national rankings now, and it's really good for the most part. Yeah. Uh, They're number 39 in total defense in the country. And that's a 2-16. and (laughs) That's really impressive. Wow. And they're number 18 now in rush defense, which was their problem at the beginning of the season. And number 80 in pass defense, obviously we thought that would be better, but you know, I'm sure as you get more talent in here, that will get better. But And number 38 in team tackles for loss this season in the country. All of those numbers lead to me saying that Brian Ward, probably the best defensive coach or best, best assistant coach on this Arizona State staff, and he deserves to stick around. And you've got to make sure that you extend this guy so that you can keep him around for a few years because he might decide to go take his own head coaching opportunity, which hats off to him if he does. But, you know, as ASU people, you don't want to see him leave ASU. (laughs) You know, it's funny. I remember a time about regarding an individual that we're going to talk about shortly here. But I do remember there was a period in time where we were worried about a certain assistant coach that was here very recently at Arizona State that could have easily taken a head coaching job elsewhere because that was the kind of ascent that he was on. And I felt so much relief when ASU had announced that redacted name that we will mention shortly was going to be staying in the role that he was in. Obviously, my feelings are different about that now, but I like seeing the consistency here very, very early on in Dillingham's tenure. Keeps you, falling up, though, that assistant uh, redaction. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, if you look at the defense the first eight games of the season, Jesse, and and you see the score lines. The defense really kept them in the, a lot of these games, obviously, outside of the Fresno State game, where well, they did have a lot of... They, they lost 29 to nothing. They there had, were eight turnovers by the offense, and they lost 29 to nothing. Yeah. That might be their best defensive performance Yeah, we were Remember the what was it nine best. nine points allowed off of the eight turnovers? It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. That game was unbelievable defensively from yeah. Arizona State. Yes, but, but and outside of the USC game, where it seemed like when Caleb Williams wanted to score, he went down and scored. He's also Caleb Williams. Yes. So outside of those kind of one and a half games, I think the defense has been spectacular this year and kept them in games. And Jesse, to your point from uh, the post-game show that I listened to uh, on Saturday, uh, this team might be the best 2-6 and six team in the country. I don't know they're the best 2-6 <laughs> team in the country, but they're a good 2-6 and six team if you can say that. They're playing <laughs> competitive football. Yes, and they're staying in games. They, they don't have to be doing that, which is really cool to see because again they're not going to a bowl game they're depleted they really don't have to be trying this hard but shout out to kenny shout out to the staff brian ward uh, for getting these kids motivated and keeping them in these games and i expect them to win another game this year i don't know which of the four that it will be but i i do expect them to win another game this season also to convince a conference opponent coach to come to your team and be a part of the next great iteration of asu football and then to double down on it halfway a little over halfway through the year by making him your lead man defensively to your offensive approach i I love it i can't wait to see what it looks like next year when this team can be fully healthy and fully integrated into the big 12 
Um, I will say that probably relatively easy to get someone away from Pullman. Just saying. Yeah, <laughs> but it does speak volumes about... And like Wazoo uh, was on the rise the past couple yes, of years. No so. offense to Pullman. No offense. I'm not calling out Washington yeah, State. Yeah, I get everyone it. I love has, your apples. Everyone has told me the cup. that it's a great road atmosphere to go to a game at. So just... <laughs> Bear with me here. I've never been to Pullman, but yeah. I would say that a lot of people. Would I have. Say it's that nice. It's, it's better it, than. I've been to Pullman. It's it's nice. It's just small. It, it, yeah. It, it's what it's you'd a short expect. Drive to Idaho is what I've been told. Yeah, and about an hour and a half to Spokane. So there's that. If you want to go watch Gonzaga basketball. Yay. Um, so, sticking on the defensive side, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> someone who uh, we know very well, Antonio Pierce. That hey, the was, name is not redacted yes, anymore. Uh, yeah. Was named interim head coach of the Raiders. Um, what, what were they thinking there, uh, number one? Especially, I, I get maybe the players trust him and like him, right? But you know what he is accused of doing have done at he's accused of have doing at arizona state so, right so this is going to be difficult <laughs> but i'm going to try and come at this with an unobjective lens and to reset the story unobjective the non-objective the the, the su- subjective le- yeah sure let's go with that <laughs> no, I, I i thought you were saying you were going to come at this from an object never mind i'm sorry I'm, a lot of words, i'm trying to of, av- i'm trying to avoid sounding homerish big, with this take a lot of just words a second we, uh, big words for, for Jesse. just a second yeah so to reset because i'm sure a lot of our listeners don't follow whatever the heck the las vegas raiders are doing they You'd fired their head coach and gm josh mcdaniels was fired dave ziegler was fired they also moved on from their oc so the the raiders are a bit of a mess right now antonio pierce was on the staff i think he was a line i think he's a linebackers coach not Obviously anymore, not anymore. <laughs> he got raised to the role of interim head coach when i look at it from the perspective of things that he is being implicated for accused of at these college ranks doesn't necessarily have the greatest impacts at the national level because you don't have to have the same approach when it comes to team building and recruiting and all the illegal stuff that he's okay you're pointing the finger at me just here's where you're wrong i love to be wrong if you're going to cheat and do wrong things at one level What's stopping you from the next level? Yeah, what's stopping you from doing those things? Not those things specifically, but other things. I agree. I agree. And here is an excerpt from our Arizona Sports article um, from a while back. Uh, Pete Thamel, then of Yahoo Sports, now of... ESPN ESPN reported in detail more than two years ago that former defensive coordinator, associate head coach, and recruiting coordinator Antonio Pierce allegedly led the charge in pushing the boundaries of allowing recruits to visit Arizona State's campus during the dead period over a span of months before recruiting reopened in 2021. As I have said multiple times, and this is an unpopular opinion with Arizona State fans, and while he should have had a better Um, grasp and hold on his program Antonio Pierce is the one that seems to be you know more at fault here than Herm Edwards people go after Herm it's really Antonio Pierce I think that you know from reading things and it was more of a lack of institutional control from Herm so I just don't understand how the Raiders can look at that and go okay you're going to be an NFL head coach. It's just another move in the incompetency of Mark Davis. And Whoa. <laughs> he's an incompetent owner. I don't know. His basketball team's been pretty good. His basketball team, the Las Vegas Aces, really good. For some reason, can run that team. But for whatever reason, he cannot run his football team. They've gone through coach after coach, bad hire after bad hire, uh, moving on from the right players to the wrong players, things like that. Uh, You know, Josh McDaniels, horrible coaching hire. People knew what kind of head coach he was. He's not a good head coach. That was proven in Denver. And, you know, now he's going with Antonio Pierce, who, again, at Arizona State, is accused of doing these things that kind of took down the program. So this guy should not be... 
falling upwards. If anything, he should be falling backwards. I didn't even understand how he got an NFL assistant job. Like what? I said, I just I want to clarify that I'm not in approval of this move whatsoever. I was just trying to approach it from a lens that devil's advocate. NFL person yeah. is approaching it from, right? And here's the other problem. Everybody in NFL circles is loving what he had to say in his press conference the other Fine. day. Fine, whatever. And I'm just thinking, yeah. Gosh, we're about to go through this again, aren't we? I loved what he had to say all the time at ASU. Me too. I thought the players liked him and played good for him. I thought he yeah. was going to be Arizona Probably State's because he was head paying. coach. Yeah, I thought he was going to succeed Herm after Herm possibly retired. Yeah, like yes. I thought Herm would be here for a few more years, and you know, considering that I thought the trajectory was going in a good way, um, but. And then I thought that Antonio Pierce would take the reins, and that's why I thought he was kind of sticking around and not taking another head coaching job. And then everything came out that, you know, all of these allegations that, again, still haven't been punished <laughs> by the NCAA. Where's that, by the way? Let's, well, there's the self punishment. There's, so yeah, the, there's the self punishment. It lessens the blow. Well, there's the self punishment, yeah, but I would still, you know, like to see um, what the NCAA says, which I don't think is going to be very much at this point, because they seem to be, prob they're probably going to put a little bit more focus on Michigan and what's going on over there. Um, but yeah, I, again, I just don't understand this. Um, I think that you just, you just can't reward people who have done bad things at previous jobs. And I think that I would have this opinion if it wasn't Arizona State. I would have this opinion if it was like I don't think Jim Harbaugh should get a head coaching job in the NFL. If if everything that we're seeing with this Michigan scandal is true, which you know there's photo evidence out there. What about Urban Meyer? He's by all accounts a great coach, right? I, yeah, he just and, it's rewarded time after time after time after time. But I'm saying this time people are deciding not to hire him. Well, it's different when you fail at the NFL level. Yeah. I don't but, know. I'm sure he'll find some cushy college job eventually. Yeah. He's always got one foot out the door, no matter where he is. But uh, going back to the Raiders, Jesse, they had a good coach after John Gruden. Rich, Rich Visaccia. Yeah, I know. They should have kept him. They, went they made the playoffs. <laughs> they went 10-7 and Didn't seven, they? made the playoffs. Yeah. They were 3-2 and two when John Gruden resigned, and they went 10-7 and seven that season. Yep. yep. I don't get it. I, I don't get the Josh McDaniels hire, and now I... Don't get the um, the promotion to Antonio Pierce. It also just would have been a great story to hold on to Basaccia. Like, as if there wasn't enough issues around coaching higher practices at that level, Basaccia still would have been a great story. And even if it doesn't work out, you at least made the hire, you at least gave it a shot, because he was doing a really great job for them. Hey, the Big the Big 12 football schedule came out, guys, for next year. I don't know why I tripped over that. Kind of. But yes, the, uh, the matchups, what's yeah. home and what's away came out. Um, and, you know, Arizona State's going to the Big 12. So this is interesting. I do kind of like the opponents they'll get to see. It's a lot less taxing in terms of travel. I'll, I was, I'll let you read the list. I was go going ahead. to say it. So Arizona State on the road, obviously, uh, they're going to play at Arizona next year because Arizona is here uh, at the end of November. Mm -hmm. um, Texas Tech. At uh, Oklahoma State, Texas, uh, Oklahoma State was here this That's year. Three straight years, and of pokes. we and Arizona State was there last year. <laughs> uh, Kansas State and Cincinnati. Emory Jones still going to be there? No, no. He, this is his last year. Of eligibility. <laughs> He's like a six-year senior. I mean, look, that trip to Ohio is probably going to be the That's longest the only of one. the bunch. Yeah. But you avoid having to go to Central Florida. They're coming to you it's next the, year. It's That's the, huge. It's the year after that that I'm like, oh my god, the the road schedule is so easy in terms of travel. But we'll do the we'll do the home games for 2024 real quick. BYU, Utah, Kansas, and UCF. That's the only time they see UCF, I believe, until 2027. <laughs> they have to space that one out. Good. Yeah. That that's what that's what it should be. UCF should not be uh, scheduling with Arizona State all the time. I was looking Arizona. forward to going to Orlando, though. Yeah, but you can do that three years from now. It'll yeah, exactly. I can go to Disney uh, either way. No you matter. Can also, drive if, six if, hours and go to Disney. Four in hours, California. No, I dr I fly down to Florida, stay with my okay. parents. I don't need you to okay. be dramatic. Um, okay. Stuff. Anyway. The road schedule for 2025, this is what I was talking about, Mitch. The the, the easy travel, yeah. Utah, Colorado, Baylor, 
uh, and Iowa State. Which will be the toughest of the bunch, but it, it lessens the blow given that you only have four road games within the conference next year. I don't even think that Iowa... I think Iowa after. State and... and uh, is it Baylor? Yeah, Baylor. Yeah. Baylor is the one that. Yeah. So and Iowa State, in Texas again. It's, it's about the same distance. I you're now going to be playing. What is it? Three schools in the state of Texas. Now I know they're not all in the same spot because Texas is a massive state, but that's a relatively reasonable travel location for Arizona State. And we remember Quick all flight. those all those bowl games that have gone to El Paso, and it's like a five hour bus ride from my experience. It'll be easy for them to do. Um, and then at home, Arizona, Texas Tech, ta- um, TCU, uh, Houston, and West Virginia, who they don't play on the road until 2027. I know what Wolf's going to be. What are we talking ex- about here, Jeremy? I lost you. 2025. I know okay. Wolf's going to be excited about yeah. that. I just want to focus on next year's schedule because there's one thing that I'm really bummed about. Hit us. And it is the fact that this year there were eight home games for Arizona State, which was really cool. <laughs> and. You know, as somebody that doesn't get the opportunity to usually travel with the team, um, I liked that opportunity to be able to cover the vast majority of their games. Next year, it's going to be six games at home and six games on the road, which, yes, provides a little bit more free time on a Saturday. But I do like the opportunity to have eight home games. I thought it was kind of, you know, we were kind of spoiled this year as far well, as media members. You can always go to Tucson. That is true. I will go to Tucson. <laughs> I can't believe you fell for that. What are you doing, Jesse? What? We don't go to Tucson. No. We do go. <laughs> you can go check out our post-game podcast from the field at Arizona Stadium last year when we went to Tucson. True. Yeah, that was a very emotional uh, game, especially Kyle Soley after the game. And then there was like a lot of uh, there was There was tempers. a lot to take away from that yeah. game, too. <laughs> Just... Heavy. At one point, Ray was heavy. walking on the field. That's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so that's the schedule through 2025. I guess we'll get into... They 20- have it through 2027, but we're yeah, only going to we'll, look at the first couple we'll, of years. We'll get into that when it's time. Exactly. Okay, now we're going to get into the game preview, guys. Uh, taking on Utah, who was coming off a tough loss to Oregon last week. <laughs> 35-6 to six thumping by Oregon who I think is the best team in the Pac-12. That loss was at home, too. Despite their loss to Washington, I think Oregon's the best team in the Pac-12. Anyway, to the task at hand, Utah 6-2, 3-2 in the Pac-12. What do we think about this game, Mitch? I think that this is going to come down to who's going to be the better coach, but at the same time, it's clear that replacing Cam Rising at quarterback for them this year has not been that much of an issue. They've got an awesome story in Bryson Barnes, who grew up on a pig farm. That's what everybody's taking away. Mm-hmm. But on the season, he's actually been somewhat decent. The touchdown to interception ratio is not great. His completion percentage is not great. But again, they have six wins, and they're considered one of the better teams in the conference. So clearly, he's doing enough to get the job done. Yes, this game would be far different if Cam Rising was healthy enough to play. He's not going to play at all this year. So relying on this cat, Barnes, to be able to get the job done, and for the most part, he's getting the job done. And I know they just got shellacked at home, Jesse, yeah. but Rice Eccles Stadium is a massive, massive advantage for Utah. Mitch brought up the point of uh, whoever coaches better. It's so hard to outcoach Kyle Whittingham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't expect Arizona State to win this game. But they're going to keep it close. I I watched the tape from last week. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and yes, Oregon is much better than I think anybody in the Pac-12. But, like, Utah is not even close to being what they would be, I think, if they did have Cam Rising back there. Uh, I I just didn't find them to be that impressive from watching their tape. And, like, I thought their win over USC was really impressive, but then USC almost lost to Cal. USC almost lost to ASU, Jesse. Yeah. But- USC <laughs> hasn't looked good against a single conference opponent. I know we're emphasizing yeah. your point, but yeah, continue. I'm just Yeah, say- I'm just saying that, like, I wasn't very impressed with Utah. Um, they do have a really good defense. They ha- they do a really good job of stopping the run for the most part. Not really against Oregon, but nobody stops Oregon's rushing attack. Um, so I I am a bit concerned for that for ASU because that we've 
figured out as kind of their formula for success over the last couple of weeks is staying on the ground with Cam Scadaboo and DeCarlos Brooks. Yes. But, again, I just I don't see this being a typical Utah team. Um, I think that they will – I think that it's going to be a close game, again, like we have – scene with ASU they're gonna lose but <laughs> it's gonna be a close one uh, ASU seems to have a lot of trouble when going to Utah and going all the way back to that 17 nothing uh, hole they put Utah in at halftime uh, just a, four years back I, I believe it was mm-hmm. so I, I mean like they ended up losing that game and they were even ranked right and I mean they just have such hard time going to Utah and and trying to get out of there with a win. So it's going to be a difficult matchup for sure. That crowd is very, 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 very into the game. Um, And they just game plan well every single year. Every single year on both sides of the ball. But here's the thing. It's not a night game. Sure. It's a day game. 12 12 p.m. start, 11 a.m. here in Arizona. So does who comes out? Of whose rolls out of bed and is ready to hit somebody, Jesse? <laughs> I think that's that's what it's gonna be. Oh. I, I hate to be that guy, but I would think it's the team that got to sleep in their own beds the night before if they're waking up that early, right? Okay, does do we does do any of us think that it's gonna be Arizona State like coming in there and upsetting Utah on the road? Like that's not gonna well, happen. Okay. No, but we I, didn't think that they would I I didn't think that they would be necessarily close to Washington State or Washington the past either. couple well, weeks. Well, guess what? I, I Again, we figured out that it's bad to pick ASU to lose by a lot. They don't do that. That doesn't happen. Even against Fresno State, they turned the ball over eight times and didn't even let Fresno State score 30 points. ASU does not lose close games. It's perfect that you just brought up the defense and their purpose, and we've led the show today with defense and how good it's been. And I think it's time we start giving a little more credit to the defense in terms of our predictions and what we anticipate the outcome to be. And we've seen it the last, what, four weeks now, four weeks of games where they have just kept everything close. They've kept it within a single score for most of the games. And when they win them, they keep it out of that range for the most part. So you know what? I might be starting to lean a certain way just based off of, yes, Kyle Whittingham is a much better coach, and I still think Utah is going to win, but I do think ASU is going to give Utah a bit of a run for its money when they're on the field on offense, because that's what we've seen so far in this conference schedule. Yeah, I think it's going to be a close slugfest between two defensive teams. It's going to look a little bit like that Washington game. It's not going to be a fun game to watch if you're not into defense. Um, if, if you, if <laughs> These you like, teams should be going to the Big Ten, I don't understand. Yeah, if you want to go... You know, if you like to watch Iowa and Purdue, this is going to be the game for you to watch <laughs> because this game is going to be, you know, it, whoever wins in the trenches, a big thing for ASU is going to be they've got to contain Sione Vakai on like literally everywhere because he plays safety, he plays running back, yes. he's great. He's for, so good. <laughs> catching the ball out of the backfield. Uh, he leads their team in tackles. He's got a pick. Uh, he's averaging like eight yards a carry on the ground, um, twenty-four yards per reception through the air. Just don't, just, just you know, keep a spy on him. Watch out for him. Don't, don't run in his direction. Don't throw in his direction. Just contain him, and you got a chance in this one. That's my opinion. So you're telling me he's Travis Hunter with. Without the PR, he's Correct. better Travis Hunter. That's Ooh. what people are saying. He's better Travis I, Hunter uh, f- right now. Yes, but Travis Hunter has a very bright future. Hey, Hunter, here's he- Jeremy with potential again. Enough, <laughs> enough, enough of potential, Jeremy. What is the f- player doing right now? Uh, he, <laughs> lacerated spleen or something. Okay, <laughs> he, he's he's good though. But like this guy's better. Um. To go back to the defensive points uh, that you were making. Anthony Richardson's going to be so good. Will you stop? He's been fine. He's out for the season. Hurt. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Number 18. Which is not a bad thing. (laughs) Utah, number 18 defense. uh, ASU, number 39 defense. So, like you said, Jesse, the numbers back up what we're possibly going to see on Saturday. What we're going to see. I don't want to sugarcoat it. I'm going to be shocked if this is a blowout on one side of the field because – Everything points to this being 
what we've already talked about a bunch. That's it's the defensive slugfest, the the Iowa special where it's under twenty nine and a half points or something like that. That's just yeah. That's <laughs> that's my take. I'm really I not to jump ahead, but I'm really curious and excited seeing what's the injury news coming out of practice this past week. In particular with a certain wide receiver transfer. Yeah, yeah Jeremy's guy. Jordan Tyson. Yeah, you know, potential. He led led <laughs> Colorado's it. spring game in uh, in receiving yards. And oh, then he yeah, left. Big, big time <laughs> spring game guy. <laughs> um, so he's uh, possibly going to be back. Rashada and Pine are back at practice in positional drills. I saw in pads or heard in pads too, right? Yeah. Um, but going to the quarterback play of ASU, this is how ASU is has a chance of winning this game. We talked about the running game. I feel like that's a staple at this point. We're going to see good running from both Brooks and Scadaboo. Can Trenton Borgay have a better game than he did last week? Because it wasn't it wasn't great. No, you, that's one, the game one, that he needs to have. One touchdown, three picks. That was that was just the. That's his season stats. Oh. Um, no, that's even worse. <laughs> no, uh, zero, zero touchdowns, zero picks last week. Uh, two, like, uh, around, like, 250 yards, if I remember right. It was 19 of 26. Um, I think that, again, he did what they needed him to do. Uh, again, he managed uh, the- sorry, w- World Series, that, that's why I got the stat wrong. Go ahead. Okay, Go ahead. Yeah, we know. We know. You're, you're so cool. Um, Suns game. Anyway, you uh, yeah, you weren't even cover you weren't even doing the World Series. Oh You're my covering gosh. the Suns. Gentlemen, please. Uh, you know. Jeremy and I argue a lot. This is a thing. Trenton Borgay. We still like each other. Trenton Borgay. We do. Yes, Trenton Borgay. He managed the game well. He was a good game manager. That's what they need out of him. They don't need him to be trying to do things that... Or they don't need to be putting him into situations where he is set up to try to do things that Rashada can do. Because he can't do that. We know what to expect from Trenton Borgay most of the time. So that expectation is he's going to get the ball into whatever receiver's hands he sees is open. He's going to read the field pretty well. Can he throw it downfield? Sometimes, but it's really... Over the heads of his receivers <laughs> yeah, a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> the Jimmy G special he has to tie like, back to Raiders. He has, like, sneaky arm strength, but it's not arm strength that you, like, want. It's, it's not accurate. accurate. It's not accurately... It's Josh it's Allen not. before Josh Allen started to become accurate. I don't know about that, but <laughs> let, let's uh, let's calm down on calling Dritton Bourget jo- Josh Allen. But sneaky anyway, arm strength, what do you mean? Anyway, <laughs> Josh Allen doesn't have sneaky arm strength. He's got an absolute <laughs> rifle, a cannon. Oh, my gosh. Um, but, no, uh, yeah, you just got to keep Trenton in positions where he's going to succeed so yeah there was eight to ten yard throws you know across the middle of the field to his tight ends they did a great job they hit four tight ends last week which was awesome to see you were so happy to see messiah swinson out there were you not i yeah i saw mm-hmm. him i found him he's uh, always on field goal uh team yeah yeah he's a good blocker Six, he eight. he's found his role as mm-hmm. the, the cool. coaches say but Guys like him need to get need to get the ball. Jalen Conyers needs to get the ball. Elijah Badger doesn't need to be flying down the field for big receptions. You can give him the ball with like a you know a five yard slant route. And He's so he shifty, off. man. Yeah. Like you get him the ball, he'll break a tackle at least one on a fly. And to go back to what we were mentioning earlier, may get to weave Jordan Tyson into this mix too. Yeah, who's kind of like a Badger light in a sense. I'm really looking forward to seeing, with all the options that Borgay has, this should be a really easy game to just basically don't throw it away. Cool thing about this Tyson situation is, too, is he's going to be coming back for four games so he can preserve a red shirt by playing. That would be fantastic. So We would love that. Um, Can I actually tangent off of the red shirt discussion? Yes, of course. if Rashada is out there in pads, I'm not saying like this is going to be anytime soon or whatever, but if Rashada really is out there in pads, and we are within the final four games, he's played two, Correct. three, two. two. Is there a chance that we see Rashada again this season? I think so. I don't want to. I, I, I want to see him again. I don't want to risk another injury. I want to see him again, and but I don't know if... like He's got two more games left, and I don't think that... 
if you're going to bring him back, you need to bring him back next week. Sit him for Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> or play him against Oregon. And then, you know, give Trenton the start in the Territorial Cup to try to get that, you know, revenge game from last year, which I think would be kind of the smart move. I just don't want him coming back against Oregon. So that's I, my big thing here. I understand the take about getting him in as early as he's able to and then maybe going back to Trenton as like a here's your here's your next chance, but I don't want to do the back and forth approach if you're going to bring Rashada in. If you're going to bring him back in for only a couple of games, make them the last two. Mm-hmm. I know that Oregon is not the the best option, so if it's not Oregon, just bring him back for the territorial game. But Here's I, I the problem. It, I don't think the shuffling matters when it's this late in the season with the record where it is. You want to give Trenton that start. Who knows if Trenton's going to decide to play football next right, year. Right, that's what and, I was thinking. And you want to give him that start in the cup in the territorial cup you know he could also transfer somewhere else and play somewhere else he's got one more year of eligibility after this one and and so i think that you give you give trend that start in the territorial cup and i would like to see rashada for the two games prior to that i don't think it's too much of a shuffle i don't think it's going to be a problem to do that at this point in the season the players know what they have in rashada and they know what they have in borgay I don't think it's going to mess anything up or lead to, you know, a loss of the Territorial Cup because that's their championship this year. I don't think it'll it'll lead to that necessarily because, again, the players are comfortable with both guys. Um, I just I think that they should just ride it out with with Borgay this the rest of the season. I don't okay. think Rashada should come back this year. I don't want to risk another injury. He can learn behind Trenton some more. Um, he can learn the offense by watching from the sidelines, and then he is the starting quarterback day one of camp next year. Mm, I don't know. I just want to see him. I, I, I know think, you do. I think selfishly we all do. I'd yeah. like to see. Yes. I'd like to see the if he can put together four quarters of a football game before next season. And you know what? Maybe he just needs another off season to do that. Maybe we won't get to see that this year at all, and maybe he'll be ecstatic and ready for the task next year. And we'll get to see what Jaden Rashada truly is based off of everything we've heard about him coming out of high school. Maybe we will get to see that guy. It just might not be this year. Just keep Drew Pine off the field, please. No offense to Drew Pine, but keep him off the field. Uh, let's get to some uh, some other stuff going on around uh, ASU athletics. Volleyball. Oh, doggy volleyball. volleyball. Let's go. Upsets number three Oregon in straight sets. They're now up to number 15 in the country. Didn't they upset Stanford too? Yes, that was oh, last week. Oh, my gosh. Week. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry. That uh, it was Stanford that they upset, not Oregon. I apologize. That's a mistake in the show sheet. Yeah, you're right. Do you want to start? Over? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> a lot going on. Anyway, three, two, and one. All right. Uh, over to some other things happening in Arizona State athletics. Volleyball upsets number three Stanford. Let's go, baby. 21 and three on the season, up to number 15 in the country. This team just continues to impress Mitch. What what are we seeing right now from this team? Look, generally speaking, I just loved seeing the the video that the social team put out afterwards of Coach Van Neal getting the 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 yeah, shower cool. afterwards. Like that was a that was an awesome win. And we've seen a lot of awesome wins and a lot of dominance from this team this year. A lot of Marta Levinska this year just absolutely dominating in her role on the outside. This this is a legit like renaissance for the volleyball team and that's that's not to knock what uh Sonia Tomasevich has done with her program because there have been good players in and out but this is like the best that I've seen out of volleyball in any of the years that I've been here in Arizona what I think is absolutely incredible about this and what we talked about earlier in this season is that you know they were kind of beating up on the lesser teams in non-conference play right and we really wanted to see what happened when they got into conference play we were um, skeptical, and I, I think that we have the right to be skeptical given the program's history. But just this turnaround is unbelievable. How they've gone from, you know, a team that just, again, for a while there, I felt like Sun Devil Athletics, they were kind of an afterthought to this, but they're just an example of how you can turn something that is a sleeping giant into an actual giant 
pretty dang quickly. And shout out to Coach Van Neal. Um, shout out to Marta Levinska, the national player of the week, by the way. Mm-hmm. And it's not just her. They have a whole bunch of good players. And, like, this team... I think there might even be too lowly ranked. Like Jeremy said, I was going through the rankings, and there's only a few teams that have at least you know 21 wins, and they're at 15. I don't know how I feel about that. I they're, think that they should be ranked a little bit higher at this point. They were one of three teams uh, to be undefeated at, at a point this season. One, one of three teams left to be and undefeated. And we were like clamoring for them to get ranked at that point. Yeah. And then after they pulled off the, uh, I think it was the UCLA upset if i'm not mistaken earlier in the year that was when we were really clamoring like all right they got to be ranked now yeah. right yeah and i think to our earlier points about the non-conference schedule is nothing spectacular at the same time you can weave in a colorado loss that just uh, didn't really make the yeah. volleyball team look like the volleyball team we expected them to be this year so i get it if you put them at 15 because there's not necessarily a ton of pedigree and the schedule hasn't given them a ton of favors. But wins like this matter a and ton. And you just got to get in. Like, you just got to get into the dance and yes. advance, survive in advance, as they like to say. And obviously, we'll talk a ton about that when that uh, comes about. I can't wait for the NCAA uh, Women's Volleyball Championships this year. It's going to be pretty freaking awesome. Um, now over to some baseball. Uh, congratulations to the Texas Rangers on winning the World Series, by the way. But nah, <laughs> <laughs> they but. beat the O's and then they beat the D backs. I'm a uh, I'm an Orioles guy, so okay. not a fan. Thank you. Um, anyway, the actual baseball news that we want to share with you: Spencer Torkelson is uh, nominated for a Silver Slugger Award this year. Dude hit a ton of torque bombs. Yep. It's what happens when you get to do all that all season. Yeah, something like he had thirty plus. I know, I know that. For he was sure. their team's leader, the Tigers. Yeah, uh, yep. I think that he uh, he's really coming into his own over there in Detroit. It's pretty nice to learn uh, from Miguel Cabrera in his first two years, right? Like to learn well, from one of the best players of all time. Yeah, he and says have, he's been great, and to have that him. in his clubhouse. Like, see, it's funny too because I remember back to draft night because he went number one overall um, during that COVID shutdown portion. The, I mean, the whole season was shut down that year. And he goes number one overall. And I remember distinctly they drafted him as a third baseman. And in my mind, I'm thinking, there's no way. There's no way. Because yeah. Miguel Cabrera's his time is starting to run down. And obviously now he's transitioned into his rifle position at first base. And the defense ain't too shabby neither. Like He's probably a few years away from any gold glove kind of potential. But Torkelson's starting to come, come into his own and starting to look like the guy that we saw the last couple of seasons that he was here at Arizona State. Yeah, all, it really, all that's really left for him is you know cutting down on the strikeouts, yeah. raising the batting average a little bit. On base percentage. On base percentage. Th- those, those things. And then he's one of the top players in baseball, all-star kind of guy. Because right now he's a very valuable power hitter slugger that kind yes. of player once he develops those into those other skills then he could be really good and I, you know I could kind of put his path on the same track as Anthony Rizzo because Anthony Rizzo came out of the gate uh, with San Diego he was really bad and then he came to Chicago had an okay year where he had like 23 homers hit like 235 something like that and then he took off and became the Anthony Rizzo that we've seen for the past decade, and that that's kind of the trajectory I can I can see from Torkelson. It's it's not it's going to be kind of a slow burn to get to being that like you know bet, really good player. If he could become a career like two seventy and thirty homers a year kind of a player with some above average defense, I think we're going to get the wonderful years of Tor- Torkelson to come. That's really cool to see now. Let's get to our predictions for the week. Jesse, ASU going into Utah. What do you got? Utah's going to win this one 14 to 7. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> It's going to be a slugfest. If we have to sit through 14 to 7 at 11 in the morning, I think I might, I might just go back to bed. Um, but that is feasible. Uh, I also think that Utah's going to win. I think Rice Eccles is just one of the better home field advantages in college football. Yep. Even though they got their butts handed to them last week. Even I'm, more of a reason for them to want to come out and show off exactly. in front of their home fans. Um, I'm going to stay with the stats because every time I go against the grain, I get proven wrong. So with the stats, 
I think I'm going to feel out a 20 to 17 okay. Utah. Okay. I'm going to go 24 to 14 Utah. They get a touchdown late. They're up by a field goal. They get a touchdown late to put away ASU. Um, I think it's going to be close, though, throughout the entire game. It's going to be a defensive battle. Not a 14-7 to 7 defensive battle, I don't hmm. think. But I, it's, it's feasible still. But All I'm saying is that I'm happy that we're all keeping it close this time and that Jeremy's not picking a massive blowout because it's just not going to happen this year. You know what? I'm actually curious. I'm going to dig for the over-under. Like, stall for me if you could. Yeah, but the, I'm just curious what they said it at. If, if ASU comes out and plays the defense that they have played this year, especially against Washington, um, I think that they could definitely keep it close especially with the lackluster quarterback play that utah has gotten this year with the pig farmer um (laughs) but um i listen if asu can keep it close and have a chance to win at the end that's all we can ask for at this point in the season they're two and six they don't have a chance of going to a bowl and you know possibly keep it close so our friends uh at fanduel have Utah as an 11 and a half point favorite oh, and an ridiculous. over under at 41 and a half. Ridiculous. I that, is, that is some ridiculous feels stuff. Feels a little right high. There. Feels a little high. I don't know how I feel about that. ASU money line? Plus 310, <laughs> I think. But obviously, it was that's, not, you know, that's not FanDuel's like, that's just how it. That's not a diss at FanDuel. That's just how Vegas is. <laughs> yeah, set Vegas up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> controls this thing. We, not FanDuel. we love our friends at FanDuel. Thank yes, you, exactly. Arizona yes. Sports. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of State of the Sun Devils. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, threads as well, at AZ Sports Devils. You can watch this. Hey, guys, wave. You can watch this on YouTube. If you feel like you're missing out right now because I'm calling you guys out, please go over and watch this on YouTube. It's on the Arizona Sports we got a helmet. YouTube channel. You can't see the helmet if you're not watching the podcast. Jesse, you writing for us this week or no? No, because it's a road game, so we'll just do whatever the web editors write. Well, Jesse does a great job doing everything here. Writes on ArizonaSports.com every once in a while. You can check out his game recap from the Washington we'll State We'll be covering game. the first uh, men's hoops game. Sweet. Yeah. You can follow him on, uh, on everything as well. We should tease that too. That after the game on Saturday, we're going to start looking deep into the men's and the women's basketball teams. Mm-hmm. We're going to put together a preview pod for that as well. So that's going to come out soon as well. Yes. So thank you so much for listening. For my good friends, Mitch Varelis and Jesse Morrison. Good friends. Good friends. I'm Jeremy Schnell. <laughs> we'll talk to you on Saturday.